My name is Allison Peck. Um, I'm with Bravani, and on behalf of the Young Title Holders, thank you very much for joining the webinar. We're excited to have you all here. And we are very excited um, to have Ross, one of the founders from Punchmark here, to talk to us today. Um, so basically, um, throughout the presentation, if you guys have any, any questions at all, type them in in the chat box, um, and we'll wait until the end um, to answer any Q&As. This is being recorded, so just be aware of that. Um, and this will live in the AGS portal um, once this is done. So you could always come back and rewatch it or suggest it to any friends in the industry who you might think may benefit from it. So at this time, we'll take it away to Ross and uh, we'll, we'll come on uh, at the end, like I said, to answer any questions. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Ali. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, I am going to be essentially going through um, what it takes to be what we like to call an omni-channel retailer. Um, we were the biggest takeaways that I'd like for you guys to leave with um, is, you know, strengthening your store to website connection. Number one, the aesthetics of that, um, improving your customer experience, increasing sales in store and online, right? Who doesn't want that? And uh, making operations more efficient in the pro process. So um, just a brief intro about me. Um, I'm CEO and co-founder of Punchmark. Um, we've been in business for almost 14 years. Uh, I've been in the industry for a while, practically born into it, uh, essentially like family businesses, almost 30 years, I guess you could say. Um, and you know, since Punchmark was founded in 2008, um, we've grown immensely this past these past 14 years with our own jewelry website platform. And with that said, we gained a lot of incredible insights as to how omnichannel works in this industry because um, number one, we partnered with the largest point of sale uh, in the industry, the edge, uh, Abbott Jewelry Systems, uh, for over 10 years with them. Um, we've been teaching jewelers how to integrate their stores with their websites. And you know we started off with products, uh, and then transitioned into customers and wish lists. And so um, as a leading e-commerce company, you know, we thought products were always going to be our main focus, but it wasn't until we got into the bi-directional aspect of the point of sale integration that we really started pushing the needle um, as far as like what we could learn and what we could actually uh, push into the industry to, you know, make some changes, significant changes to uh, individual stores and having an impact on the industry itself. Um, so beyond products, it was basically lining up the customers and their wish lists that made the biggest impact. Um, so because you know we provide websites and digital marketing, uh, it's the practice of this that you know takes all that we learn and connects all the right dots, you know, in in order to drive the most traffic and sales for our customers. So, <clears throat> um, and in this practice, we learned that. that one of the keys to the industry, right? And it's not about you know what products you have and how much they cost. It's about who wants them at which specific moments in their mm -hmm. lives, right? Those special moments, as you all know, as jewelry store owners, right? So um, jumping right into this, um, I want to cover let let you guys know what topics we'll be covering today. Um, first, we're going to be talking about you know what is omnichannel retailing. Uh, we're going to cover the right business habits creating the most leverage for your store and your website, delivering a consistent customer experience. What I like to go through is the, the five W's of omni-channel. Uh, e-commerce, uh, effective e-commerce tactics, things that you can actually do yourself, uh, followed by a, a Q and A. <clears throat> so what is omni-channel retailing? So the definition of omni-channel retailing is a retailer's efforts to provide a seamless, customer experience across all possible channels. So just to uh, take a little uh, a side trip as far as what's the difference between what they call single channel, multi-channel and omni-channel so we can outline the difference. Single channel is one channel, right? It's, it could be your website, your store itself, a social media channel specifically, it's just Facebook or even something like eBay, right? If you're a single channel retailer, then you're focusing on one thing and doing that thing effectively. Um, for lots of people, it was the brick and mortar uh, store until websites came along and then websites and then social media. So then that became multi-channel e-commerce or multi-channel commerce, I should say. 
So this approach finds customers where they are, both online and offline, right? So Instagram shopping and even on TikTok and just being ever present in all the channels. Now, the difference between those and omni-channel is this re it relies on multi-channel in order to work, right? But creates the same experience across all channels through seamless data sharing. So why omni-channel? You know, when you really dissect what a, a brand is, it's all about consistency. And, you know, Punchmark started off in branding and even the name Punchmark was derived from the ancient process of punchmarking coins, right? As a coin is only worth its weight in metal until it's stamped with a symbol and then therefore it becomes valuable with that value. Now, expanding that same thought about coins, if I asked you what makes a quarter a quarter, you'd probably be able to tell me a lot, even without looking at it. You know, it's, it's shiny, it's silvery color, George Washington, right, is on it, eagle on the back, ridges on the side. Now, when we develop a brand, we typically create a brand style guide. And this is a set of instructions that tells anyone using the brand how to use it in a way that's always consistent. Now, the same level of consistency is applied to omnichannel. You can take literally any element of your brand, your logo itself, a certain color scheme, five words you always say in the same order, a photo of the same model, your humorous or playful tone, your timeless and elegant demeanor, right? Your quirky and steampunk vibe, right? No matter what your personality is of your brand, it, you could take all those elements or even one of them and apply it across every channel out there. So what I'm getting at is essentially a good omni-channel strategy is not much different than a good brand strategy. And we're going to explore how a retailer can actually do it effectively. So if you look at the right business habits, right? As business owners and managers, think about any role in your business, anyone you've hired recently, sales associates, inventory managers, accountants, uh, bench jewelers. Think about any of those roles and put yourself in there, right? So let's, let's take like an inventory specialist, for instance. Now think about what happens to this role over time. So at first, let's say this person's entering inventory into the POS, right? And after a while, they're getting really good at it taking a quick photo for identification purposes, jotting down a description, selecting the category, entering the vendor, cost, markup, deriving retail from those, and even making a game out of it to see if you can get it all done in less than two and a half minutes per product, right? So you're, you're getting effective. Then you're running reports on what inventory is selling quickest. You're even researching what's selling in your market and what's helping, that's actually helping you to do your job better. So then the store manager starts sending you to trade shows and you can start picking out merchandise there you're calling vendors, you're getting other, other pieces in. Now a year goes by and you're handling a lot more tasks and you're flooded with a lot more responsibility and your role has gotten so much more complex than it was before. You're making a lot more money, but you're finding that you don't have time to get everything that you need done, right? As business owners, lots of us have the misconception that this is the evolution of what our role should become at the very top. To continue taking on more responsibility so that our position is of the utmost complexity and therefore the most importance. So somehow we end up in this lonely place where we think we're the only person who can handle something a certain way. How many people have said, if I wanna get it done right, I just have to do it myself. And some, for some reason we think in life, there's this evolution from dependence to independence where the end goal is to go from, you know, you're taking care of me from a dependent aspect to I'm taking care of me. So if you've read the, high, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which I would highly recommend if you haven't, you'll know what I mean when I say there's this third level of evolution. So the mistake, like I said, is thinking that we start as a baby, right? Being dependent, saying you're taking care of me, to becoming adults and being independent, saying, you know what, I'm taking care of me. That's the end. But the reality is there is a third level. We go from dependence to independence to interdependence. So we graduate from you take care of me to I take care of me, and then to we graduate to we take care of us. So this is the definition of being a community, and it's the best possible outcome from, for growing a business, not a business where owners are the ones stuck working until 11 o'clock at night closing down the store, right? It's a business that runs smoothly because it depends on people, on processes, 
and on the right technology so that we can focus on the prior priority, right? And what's the priority? The people that we buy our jewelry for, right? Our family. So, so that's at the end of the day, the biggest takeaway for me as a business owner, I find that I get lost in the swing of things. And I myself have learned how to, you know, step outside of that. So creating the most leverage. So one of the biggest things here, oh, excuse me. Let me make sure I'm still sharing my screen here. I think I just lost it. Um, hang on one second. All right, there it is. Just wanted to make sure it was still sh sharing. Sorry about that. So when we're creating the most leverage, uh, one of the biggest things that I want to talk about is creating SOPs, right? Standard operating procedures and, you know, committing to them, training your staff on those things. Now, I'm still guilty of doing things that the CEO of the company shouldn't be doing, right? As we all are as business owners and, and high level executives and managers. But I, I will admit I've come a long way. And one example is that of that is, you know, Punchmark has created a knowledge base for our clients. And also we created an internal knowledge base for our employees. So I may find myself still like doing stuff like going to the store and buying coffee. Um, you know, and I mean, like, let's face it, I'm a coffee snob, right? So I, I feel good about that. Um, but but if, I I was, if I was removed from the equation for whatever reason, our daily operations wouldn't suffer one bit, right? They'd be totally fine without me. And your product intake process should be, you know, efficient and well-defined. So take the guesswork out of it so that when you hire someone, they just have to read for about 15 minutes to learn your process so that you don't have to like reinvent the wheel every single time. And then you, you get your team to speak the same language where, you know, like imagine if your sales staff said the same exact thing to your customer in the store that they say in a web chat, right? Talk about consistency. Then everyone's on the same page. And that's one less thing you have to think about. Make multi-dimensional chess moves, right? So if anyone plays chess, you know, E2 to E4, right, is one of the most common opening moves. It's, put, it's pushing the pawn to the center of the board. You open up the queen's line of sight, you open up the bishop's line of sight, and you also take control of the, the center control of the board at the same time. So these types of moves are, are effective by doing multiple things at the same time. Kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. So, you know, in the past, here's an example. In the past, people used to manage two separate inventories, and some people still do, where you have your store inventory and your website inventory, Right. So something sells online, now you got to update in two places, you have to, uh, and then the price of gold fluctuates, let's say you, gold was 1400, then it's 1800. Now you, you won't even make margin on it if it's sold for the same cost you had on your website. So by integrating your point of sale to your website, it's literally one of those big chess moves. Another option, another example is having your Facebook and catalog, Facebook catalog and Instagram catalog automated so that anything you post to your website will automatically go to Facebook and Instagram so that lets the system actually retarget customers later without even having to think about it, right? So these are a, a really, really heavy pieces of leverage that take a lot of things out of your daily operations. Um, another thing is to take advantage of user contributed content. So if customers can go on your website and add their anniversary and birthday, this not only saves a step for what your employees might do in the store, but it also gives you another attribute that you can use to market to them just in time. Um, and nowadays, the crazy thing is something like this isn't a nice to have thing. Your customers actually expect it. They expect to be able to have that access that they have in all other apps, apps and technology and websites. Um, another thing is to work with companies that work together. So, um, I apologize if, if anyone does, but if you use QuickBooks for your inventory, you'd create lots, you'd, you need to create lots of parameters from scratch, right? And I'm not, not even sure you could, but in order to keep everything organized specific to jewelry, like your product in, intake process might be lengthy and tiresome. Um, or if your credit card terminal doesn't connect to your point of sale, there's lots of extra data entry you need to do later or simultaneously or while the customer's waiting. And then if you make a mistake, there's a margin of error you need to reconcile later. Um, or if you hired a local company to do your website, you know, you might save a little bit of money, but 
you know, when you have to teach someone about the scale between F and SI3 and how to build those sliders so that the diamond search could work properly with data, like imagine you having to convey that to a web developer, like that's a, that's a big responsibility. And some of you, in fact, might've actually had to do that at one point. So imagine also if you have to get your, your web guy constantly in touch with the vendors, so they can get the images and the data, learn how to format it every single time. Um, so what I'm getting at is when you constantly have to do work twice and then you're creating human error, you also have to go back and check your work. What's the opportunity cost there? And, you know, why does the SaaS model work better than the traditional software model, right? Uh, one thing that I coined was invest in the snowball, not in the snowman. And I came up with this because in the past, as a software company, our model was that we would all work together to build this amazing website for someone until it was, we actually use the word, finished, completed, done. But this frame of mind is no different than erecting a beautiful snowman in the field, you know, in the middle of a field in the middle of July, and then walking away from it, right? So if you don't live in the Arctic, then we all know what happens to that snowman, right? Um, so if you focus on building this great website, for instance, this magnificent balance between form and function, the minute you launch it, it becomes obsolete. So the SaaS model corrects that static problem and lets us be dynamic. It lets companies like ours think about what it looks like on launch day, but also gives us the liberty to focus on what it'll be like three months or two years from now. And we can actually sustain that. So, you know, we, and we practice what we preach too. We pay Adobe a bunch of money every month and we get everything they offer, right? Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Premiere, Audition. We started a podcast in, in 2020. We already had the software to produce it based on what we were purchasing. So, and in a couple of months, I'm going from QuickBooks desktop to QuickBooks online. So it's, it's a lot easier for me to do, you know, business operations. So these, these SaaS model companies, it's, it's a lot more sustainable because you know what you're buying into on day one is going to be sustained on day 365. So those companies working together are huge. And that SaaS model is more like a snowball that's effectively helping everyone uh, work together. Another thing is using technology to your advantage. Um, for example, abandoned, abandoned cart notifications, right? So if somebody adds something to, the, to their cart and forgets, it's so nice to, to be able to have an email go out to remind them that they might've left something behind. Um, you can set up customer triggers and automated workflows. So like someone does something, another thing happens. And, and for us, like these automated workflows have really streamlined our company for everything from support ticket organization to sales pipeline automation to like marketing segmentation, right? So, you know, we use HubSpot. I know a lot of other people use Salesforce or even Klaviyo or other tools out there, but you know, whatever your poison, right? The more complex the tool, the more far reaching your company can be. So, you know, you have to make sure that whatever tool you use, try to connect as many dots as possible. Try to connect pieces and, and wire the data together from your point of sale to the CRM so that everything works together hand in hand, because without it, you could have this really massive tool, but you're not utilizing all of the technology that it offers, right? We, we are guilty of that with HubSpot until we actually wired all the things ourselves so that it works a lot more seamlessly with our, our current, uh, you know, CRM that we use in-house. So if, if you think about, um, delivering a, uh, a consistent customer experience. You know, rule number one is, you know, you don't wanna get in your own way, right? So a poor performing website is like a front door to your store without a handle, but you never realize it because you walk through the back door every day, right? So you have to think about your customer, you think about your website in a way you've never thought of your website before, like from your customer's perspective. So you may have expectations of your own website because you're one of the people who worked on it and you know what it took to build it. But when it comes to technology, you know, people have some pretty incredible expectations. So, you know, even my expectations surprise me sometimes when I'm in the heat of the moment in retail. You know, I was in Home Depot looking for those lawn marker flags. And I that's such a miscellaneous thing that I was walking through and I couldn't get anybody's attention. So what did I do? I looked at homedepot.com, searched for it, and I not only found that they had it in stock, but it told me what aisle and what bin it was in. 
So I was able to self-serve, but I expected that. You know, I, I actually expected someone like Home Depot to, to lead me to that myself. So a lot of your customers are going to have those expectations too. And then when they reach for it, they might not have it. So the more we can build as a, as a expectation meeting, you know, uh, methodology, the, the more successful we'll be for those people who are self-serving. So as far as looking at your, your website through your customer's lens, think about, you know, try to try to buy something for your wife or your your significant other on your website. You know, try, try to go through the process yourself. Um, don't just look at the product, you know, find it, add it to the cart, go as far as you can with the checkout process, record how long it takes to find it and other things you notice that might prevent you from purchasing it. Think of other people you'd buy jewelry for, right? A cousin, niece or nep nephew that are graduating high school or college. Think about your mom or dad, right? Think about other price points and see how quickly you can find something in a price point, having a, having a specific time in mind when you need it, right, at your front door. So, you know, also look at um, how to present brands on your website. So if there are brands that are big draws to your market or your store, use that as much as possible. Like if you have a billboard of Rolex out on, on the highway or you know, if you have hearts on fire, you take some of those big brands that have national advertising behind them, you know, use that as leverage, right? Because clearly you bought into that brand um, and it's a big win for you when people are looking for that type of brand. So these companies have assets that can be used to help build and convey the trust that consumers already have with these brands. So it's why we've partner partnered with hundreds of brands to help our retailers deliver that consistent experience. And, you know, big brands have brand style guides, right? Think about the Rolex pages that, you know, Punchmark has created for clients who are authorized Ro Rolex dealers and the level of consistency, consistency that needs to go into those. Um, you know, and, and another component is to figure out a way to tie in all the brands together in some way. So don't forget that your brand as the jewelry store should always be the epicenter. Uh, don't just like paste a bunch of iframes and micro sites on your website and expect it to be this just magical thing. Um, you know, a side note on that, if, if you have those iframes and those vendor provided product embeds, if you wanna call them, you know, they have benefits, but they are, there are also some drawbacks that you need to consider. Um, one of them is SEO. You get zero SEO for those iframes. Another is consistency of like your cart, your wish list, product categories all being together. Um, and another is, let's say you have all of your bridal jewelry in an iframe, and then someone goes into your global website search and types in the word halo, those products don't even come up. So to them, to that perspective, they might be looking for a specific product and then they just assume you don't have it, right? So the beauty is that the embeddable pages are extremely turnkey. They have lots of value, but you know, make sure you think about your strategy and how you incorporate them with the rest of your content and products to make sure that it's actually seamless and it matches the consistency that you're trying to do on your website. So another step is making sure that you have the right photos and videos of your products. Um, when you can, try to get images from the vendor whenever possible. So that's that leverage, right? You have vendors who are already spending the time and the money on all these, all these images. So utilize that as much as possible. Use a gem light box or equivalent to, uh, to actually take products, take photos of you know, estate pieces, custom pieces that you obviously can't get from a vendor. Now, I love, I love hearing success stories about the gem light box. Um, and you know, like show me a store that has your, their, their stuff in order and it, it makes me giddy when you see it actually being done effectively. And honestly, like, I don't care if the images are terrible. Like, I just love hearing what someone tells me you know, we bought the gem light box and we've used it for 500 of our custom pieces and estate jewelry pieces. And it's amazing, right? Not like we bought the gem light box and it's been an extremely useful, you know, paperweight or holding the back door open. So like that happens. A lot of times we, we, we buy into the technology, we want the technology and then we don't utilize it. So that's why going back to that, create the standard operating procedure and commit to it and train your staff is a very important thing for when you utilize these pieces of technology. So just a couple rules of thumb when it comes to photography, um, take photos on the same background every time. Um, square images on white are the most common, right? For, for just for consistency's purposes. 
But if you want to get fancy and use nature images and leaves and stuff like that, then fine. But do that for all your images, not just a, a few of them, right? Be as consistent as possible across the whole board. Um, take videos when possible, but do it on as many items as you can for consistency. Try to have a process where you go in as quickly as possible and you get that 360 degree rotating video and then figure out a way that you save it quickly, get it into your point of sale so that it gets in your website. And also take multiple angles, you know, take one to two shots of jewelry yourself. This is why I say when you shop on your website as if you're the customer and you're looking for a very specific piece, a lot of times if I'm looking for something for my wife, I want to see what it looks like on a person, right? So maybe take a couple shots on yourself or some of your employees. It's huge. It goes such a long way. You have this beautiful cuff bracelet, but you don't know how thick it looks on the actual wrist right with or with a sweater coming down to it like there there are a lot of aspects that really get someone to actually commit to buying something and a lot of it a lot of it has to do with seeing it on themselves or seeing it on another human being just like clothing if you're going to buy clothing on a website you're going to want to see it worn you're not going to want to see a t-shirt laying flat on somebody's you know desk so and another thing about taking people photos is that psycho psychologically Photos of people wearing your product are sort of like a subconscious testimonial that they like the product and so should you, right? So, so it goes a long way to add, add that extra layer. And I know it takes a few extra minutes to get these photos, but you know, just think about that when you, your product intake process is very important because now that the world is listening and the world is watching what you do, especially for the customers who are integrated with bi-directional, um, it really, really goes a long way. So product descriptions, right? We want to think about um, a few points here. There's five to six points. And I say five to six because in some cases, some of them don't apply. So you have, you know, brand, gender, metal, gemstone, style, and jewelry type, right? So for example, Bravani ladies, 14 karat yellow gold diamond pave heart pendant, right? So that's a lot of words, but you want to make sure that all those words are covered at the very least. If there is a brand, if it's sort of brandless or if it's like something from Stellar that you have in your in your your stock, you know, don't worry about the brand aspect. Or if it's implied that it's ladies, then maybe don't worry about that. So that's why I say five or six will apply. But for example, like if you this this is why it's so important that you cover as many of these aspects as possible. These parameters. Imagine if you have a diamond bangle bracelet and forgot the word diamond or forgot the word bangle, you know, or you had a double halo and forgot one of those two words, right? So fish can only bite the bait that's actually in the water, right? So if, if you're trying to cast a line out there and you you forget to, to put a hook over here, forget to put a worm on this hook, you know, there's, there's only certain people that you're able to actually catch. So there are many visitors that are gonna be on your website who at multiple times, they're at multiple phases of the pro of, of their buying process at certain times. Some are just researching and looking at what might be cool. And then others are ready to buy today. So the people who are most specific in their search have the greatest amount of buyer's intent. So for example, think about someone who types in anniversary gifts or even anniversary rings, right? And then another person person types in three stone oval halo platinum anniversary ring, right? Like that's very specific, you know, which one is most likely to buy something today. So the next thing I'd like to identify is categorizing products. So think about product categories and in your point of sale system and in your store and how they differ from the website. So, you know, each one is like another line in the water, so to speak when you're going to fishing, right? So like sometimes, you know, you need to think about these as your customer sees them. Some, sometimes your customers aren't even as relatable as you think. You might call something an anniversary ring inside your store, but you know, someone might call it a three stone ring, right? So see what's most popular today in your market before you commit to these so that you look at your public facing categories on your site. Now, these are sort of those utilitarian categories that I'm talking about right now, where the utilitarian aspect is what the product is itself. Like when you think about uh, diamond pendants, you know, uh, gemstone earrings, very specific. You can't put a pendant in gemstone, gemstone earrings category, 
right? So these are very specific to the type of jewelry and they're very utilitarian in that aspect. So you look at product-based categories like the utilitarian ones, and then you have curated categories. So think about this, right? If someone walks in your store, you wouldn't just throw a, a, bag, of, a bag full of jewelry at them and say, hey, let me know if you have any questions, right? Clearly that's pretty silly, but a lot of you guys do that on your website, right? I look at a lot of websites and it's just overwhelming. So, you know, if I walk into a store and someone asks me, you know, who I'm shopping for and I'm, I respond, I say, hey, looking for something for my wife. And they say, well, what does she like? And I say, I don't know. What does she like? Right. Because like you're the jeweler, you're the professional. You tell me. Right. Um, I want to know what's trending right now. I want I want to trust the words that come out of your mouth when I'm out, about to buy something for my wife, especially if you tell me with conviction of what you think they should be. So if you told me, you know, oh, so you're telling me she's an active person. I'd love to show you this cuff bracelet that is really hot right now. And she can wear it during any activity, even when she works out. Right. Um, you tell me that I'm basically pulling out my credit card. So creating cur curated categories does exactly this on your website. So when I go to a website and I see gifts for her under five hundred dollars or even just staff favorites, those are you know, those arbitrary categories, you could put a pendant, a necklace, a bracelet, anything in there. And if someone created those, I know that I can trust someone that someone put those in there, um, even if it was a person in the back room or the, the top sales associate. So someone selected these ideas for me and took all the thinking out of it. And that's very, very important. And it doesn't really take that long to create these curated categories. So next, I want to think about being more digital in your store and being more human on your website. So what do I mean by this? Think about your staff and your process and how they interact with customers. You know, make sure that they take down as much information as possible and digitize that information. You know, record birthday, anniversary. People are more than happy to give that information up if you just ask. Some people don't. Some people do when you're only when they're buying it. But sometimes if you create your process, you know, I, I walked into, I drove into a Valvoline one time and I was surprised that someone approached me with a clipboard and said, have you ever been here before? I said, no. He said, we do things a little differently here. And then he, he, he handed me a pen and had me fill out this thing. And I just took it as this is how they operate. Imagine if you walk in the store, there's so many things that you can do to say, hey, have you ever been here before? You know, we, we do things a little differently here. It's, you know, it's all about the customer and here's why we do it. We do it to, to be able to serve you in the best way we can so that when you go on our website, we already know what to show you, things like that. If you told me that in your store, I'd be like, this is great. Go, I'm gonna or I could say, look, I decline. I don't like giving my email address out. But if you ask or if you make it a process, you can take this any way you can, right? And think about on your website, Make sure you have an online chat on your website, right? It could be the one thing that eliminates that obstacle that's holding somebody up from making a purchase. So, you know, hey, can you adjust this to a size nine for me, right? Imagine if that's the only thing holding somebody back from purchasing a ring. And, you know, don't be afraid to show some personality on the website. Write a few blog posts every month. And, you know, I know sometimes this is a, a there's a barrier. People get writer's block, but if you need some ideas, you know, we have a list of things. Our digital marketing department can, you know, we have a lot of things like as far as categories that can really take your personality and inject it into any of these categories. Um, and so, like, if you write about these things in an engaging way, you can give your, your website some fun content and they're SEO friendly, right? And you, you have a lot more lines in the water. So more words equals more bait for the people who are looking for those products. You know, they type in a word halo, you know, double halo ring. They get to a blog post that you talk about that one of your st uh, staff favorites category that one of your staff members wrote about. Then they see like, here's some examples of the double halo ring. You click on it. So someone literally got from Google to the blog post to an image to a, a product. And now they're checking out because they got so excited about it, almost as if you were telling them how excited you were about this double halo ring in the store. Right. So this is what I mean by being a little bit more human on the website. So, um, you know, another example, if you look at like the curated categories aspect, you know, think about like a Valentine's Day gift guide. You know, the, the idea is to make this extremely easy for customers to find, uh, you know, looking for something to buy. 
And it's very similar to the way that you make suggestions in the store based on their needs, right? Whether it's by price, you know, by category or by style. So um, getting into the five W's of Omnichannel. We are, are trying to, you know, emulate consistency, personality, identity, and brand here, right? So I want to get in some of these questions. Some of them are pretty obvious, but it just gets you to think in the frames of, of your customer a little bit. So I'll start with why. Um, why does someone walk in your store, right? It's a good question to ask your, yourself. It's a good question to ask your customers. <laughs> why do you like shopping here? You'll get a variety of answers. Some people like to walk into your store because your, your window boxes were very inviting, or it could be a whole multitude of things. It could be a word of mouth thing. It could be very specific to an advertising, right? But a, some of it, it could relate to your brand, right? Why does someone visit your website, right? And why would someone go back to your website? So the constant curation of categories, the seasonality, creating blog posts, if someone goes to your website once, then they come back a month later and it's exactly the same. What's their reason other than the breadth of product that you offer looking for more of that you know, product offering, right? And then this question I really like to ask people, why do you go to work every day? So this is actually the biggest driver of everything else, right? As a store owner, as a, a you know, manager, as a sales associate, whatever role you are in the jewelry store, you know, if you answer this question, all the other five W's make a lot more sense, right? So let's think about the what. Obviously, what are your products and services? What is your shipping and returns policy, right? Think about how these, how these play a role, not only in your store, but on your website. How consistent are they across both of those channels, if not across all channels for, you know, Instagram and TikTok or anywhere you put your brand? What's your discounting strategy? Are you a sale, sale, sale person, 50% half off, half the store kind of thing? Um, or do you seldom do the, the sales, right? Um, what separates you from your competitors, right? What's your thing? What's that one thing that, you know, we do things a little differently here, right? What, what's that one thing? What do you put in the box when you're shipping merchandise to people? Um, I purchased uh, some, every now and then I'll, I'll just, buy some, even though, you know, I know a lot of wholesalers, I can get things at cost. Sometimes I'll just buy something from one of our client sites just because, and, and I want to go through the experience myself, but I'll get something from my wife. Right. And, you know, a couple of times I've bought things that were, the, the experience was pretty cool because one guy sent me a, a, a box of chocolates, you know, in with there, another person had like this really nice box with awesome gift wrapping. And it just made me feel good, like made me feel like someone really cared about my purchase, right? So think about that. What do you put in the box? What kind of experience, you know, do you give customers who don't interact with you in the store? So let's talk about where. Where do you find or target your customers, right? Do you, do you send out, do you purchase lists from, you know, who makes this much money in this zip code? Do you, do you broadcast on Facebook and do boost, boosted posts? Do you do AdWord campaigns? You know, where do you find and target them? Do you do local, you know, charities and invite people and, and have uh, events, right? Things like that. Um, where are you communicating your specials? Um, where do they land on your site when they come from other channels, right? What's the landing page? If you do broadcast something out there, what is their entry? Just the homepage or is it something specific to the promotion you're thinking about? And then this is a very general question, but... Where do you want your business to go next, right? If there's a trajectory of your business and your store, you're becoming more digital, you're going more online only, you're you know, branching out to multiple locations, you know, where do you want your business to go in general? So when, right? When are your customers' birthdays, anniversaries, and other special dates? This is so important. And as you guys know, the more information you have on these customers, the more you can actually segment them and market to them. Just think about how many times you had one of your top 10 or top 100 customers and you actually picked up the phone and just said, oh, hey, John, I know it's Marie's bir you know, birthday on Friday. Have you thought about coming in? I, there's a, a really cool Onyx ring that I want to show you that's de definitely her style. Like imagine like that being set across the website as well, right? Knowing this information. 
Um, what times of the day do you catch your customers? What times of the day do you send emails? Or what times of the day do you uh, put a post on you know, this lifestyle photo or talk about a new brand you just picked up? When are your events and how often do you have them? When will your customer actually receive their jewelry, right? So this is very, very important, this when right here, especially when it comes to e-commerce. So this is when like sometimes logistics will trump quality. So like if today is Tuesday, right? And my wife's birthday is on Friday and I find something I really like on a jewelry website, but it doesn't tell me when I'm going to get it, then what do I do? I continue looking. Not for that same piece of jewelry that I really liked, but simply for something that arrives at my house by Thursday, period. So I start, the more I start uncovering and looking, I might start sacrificing quality more and more and more, almost desperately as some of uh, us guys shop, you know, like the last minute, we're just known to do it. And even if it's not even close to the same quality or the price of that original piece that I liked, the truth is, you know, I might have looked for this on a completely different website and I could even end up with something that isn't e even jewelry, right? But the point is, make sure your website can handle the logistics of when someone can get their special gift for their special person, right? You know that in store, you don't have that problem. You're handing it to them. Or if you need a special order or something, you work that out with them. Say, when do you need it by? Oh, you know, you need this and it'll special order in two weeks. So that's not going to work for your deadline. But let me show you this or let me show you something that I can get overnight. So in the store, you're handling this all the time. And if your website doesn't do that, it's a major, major hit and a blow to that actual process. So finally, looking at who, right? Who is your customer? Identifying this is very important as a lot of you have already done this. A lot of you, if I asked you and said, who's your, who's your ideal customer, right? You might say, you know, in our area, we have a lot of doctors and lawyers and they make, you know, over 150 to $200,000 a year. And that's ideal for us because they're in this segment and they're between the ages of 25 and 40 years old. Perfect. Then, you know, with that segment, you know, what they're actually looking for, right? But it's important to know who your customer is, not only in your local market physically, who can walk into your store, but in your other markets outside of that digitally, right? In all your channels. Who are they shopping for? Are there are you in a community where you have a lot of, you know, women who are over 65, divorced, who like to do self-purchases? Because I, like I know some of these communities from talking to our customers, right? So so we need to know this and knowing this on a digital scale as well will clearly help us identify those people and target them. Who do they connect with in your store or who do they chat with on your website? Um, we built this widget for one of our clients at one point, and there was a, a picture of all these sales associates. And someone walked in and said, you know, hey, can I can I talk to Walter? And they said, oh, you've you've worked with Walter before. And they said, no, I saw a picture of him on your website and I really like his style. Like who, who would have thought that someone would identify just based on an image of a person? Right. So this thing is important when you look at the digital uh, self, right? The digital aspect of your store and how it's conveyed. Who are you helping ph philanthropically, right? You know, this question actually does a full circle and loops back to the why, right? It's when, at the start, like, why do you go to work? Why are you in business? Why do you do what you do? Um, as a side note, you look at, you know, the driving force of a lot of shopping right now, millennials and Gen Z customers, and a lot of them care about businesses that have a purpose, Right. Companies that have a strong brand story and stores that care about ethically sourced products. Right. This is a very important thing for a lot of people. So when you think about this, you know, the who aspect becomes a, a, a really big community aspect of, of who you are as, as a business and as uh, an entity. So so those are the five W's, just an, uh, a little exercise I like to do to think about a, a few different aspects of your business and who you're targeting. Right. So getting into uh, my final topic here, um, some effective e-commerce tactics, right? So this is kind of wrapping up just a few of the things that I talked about today. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm gonna go through real quick, but just so that you guys identify with this to make sure that your omni-channel solution is you know, all encompassing, right? You wanna connect as many channels as possible, right? Point of sale, website, social, community, anything that you can do here. 
You want to refine your product intake process to be efficient and ensure that the web is considered when you actually take a product into your point of sale. Use photos supplied by your vendors, by your vendors whenever possible. Use the gem light box or equivalent for photos of custom or estate pieces. Ensure that each product title and or description contains five to six key attributes. Delegate your website maintenance to your most technical staff members and third party companies when possible. Be yourself, be as authentic and as human on your website as you are in your store. Provide an online chat for staff members to answer questions that remove shopping obstacles. Accept as many payment types as possible and enable fraud protection for peace of mind. Side note on this, we had customers who were actually getting orders for $5,000 in the past. And then we would see it and get excited because we, we monitor our, our store sales. And then we'd see that it was never shipped. And we'd say, hey, how come you never shipped that piece? And they say, I, I got worried because it, I, what if it was fraud? So we work, we partner with ClearSale and this peace of mind is incredible. Now we see $12,000 pieces being just shipped left and right, $15,000 pieces. And it's amazing because one of our clients who, meant, who told me, hey, I got a $7,500 sale. It was out of state and I would have cringed at this had I not had ClearSale on my site, but I shipped it. And then turns out like a week later, I got a message from one of our customers who moved away who said, hey, we just moved away, but we wanted to still purchase through you. So it would have been a red flag, but it's a peace of mind that really, really changes the game. So I highly encourage anybody out there to enable fraud sale detect, uh, protection on your website. Um, you wanna create curated categories in addition to utilitarian categories, right? Gifts for her versus silver bracelets. Logistics can trump product quality. All right, this piece arrives before her birthday versus this piece is popular. Ensure shipping time of product uh, is prominently displayed across all, all places. Create engaging landing pages for curated categories and write blog posts about featured collections or pieces. Create coupon codes and even make them specific for specific customers. I know it's common for some of our clients to create a coupon code with someone's phone number, and that's the coupon code. And they'll say, oh, uh, you know, hey, Jennifer, just want to let you know, um, you know, anything you purchase, you can even, you know, put it to category, any any bracelets that you purchase on the site, as we talked about, you'll get a 25% discount, just enter your phone number at purchase. And Jennifer's like, wow, that's very specific. That's awesome. I'm going to do that. Right. So we see that actually becoming very successful for people. You have to cater to three separate audiences. You have browsers, searchers, and previous customers. The browsers are the people who benefit mostly from those curated categories, right? They're just looking. The searchers are the people who have a very specific product in mind with the highest amount of buyer's intent. And then the previous customers are clearly people who have the highest amount, highest likelihood of transacting with you again because they've already purchased from you before. So these people are, are three different uh, audience types that you need to think about. Connect your Facebook catalog to be easily, to easily retarget customers on both Facebook and Instagram. Um, and then followed up from that is set up retargeting and dynamic product ads, DPAs. So this is using the Facebook uh, catalog to be able to hit people in their, in their uh, if they add an item to their cart and then leave your website and then they're scrolling on Facebook later or Instagram, they can see that actual product. It's 30% it's higher uh, conversion rate than other traditional models of just saying, you know, visit our store. Be more aggressive with uh, pay-per-click advertising, but only after creating engaging landing pages. Don't forget that when people click on your ads that you're, you're putting out there on all these channels, think about where they land on your website. Think about the relevance of where they land on your website. You know, if you say gifts for her uh, and then at John's Jewelers, right, they click on the link and then just go to your homepage. It's okay as long as you have a nice bridge to get them to gift that gifts for her category. But if you have a gifts for her ad out there, gifts for her under $500, shop now, you click it and it goes to a blog post that says, you know, at so-and-so jewelry store, we focus on, you know, these, these particular things and we've put together a whole guide on, you know, what's hot right now and yada, yada, and then show products on that page, right? That's a lot more engaging and relevant to that ad that you're actually promoting. So 
think about what you put in the box, right? When you ship it out and what type of experience you're creating, right? And last but not least, um, think about the post-sale follow-through, what you're sending to customers, how you follow up with them, what you send via email. So um, just as a side note, we have a e-commerce strategy checklist. Um, if, you, if you want a copy of that, um, you know, just send an email to marketing at punchmark.com and we're happy to send you a copy for free. It, it, it's pretty lengthy, lengthy. It has, you know, everything from the administrative things to set up just to look at a multiple point sort of inspection of your own website um, so that you can make sure you're all set up for e-commerce. Um, and then also, if you want to, if we want us to send you a few blog ideas, you know, just hit that same email address. Um, and our, our digital marketing uh, team will be happy to share them with you. So, um, and last but not least, if you just want some website and marketing advice in general, um, you know, just feel free to shoot us an email uh, and pick our brains. We go to uh, about 13 trade shows a year. AGS Conclave is one of them. Um, and so if anytime you ever stumble upon us, just you have some ideas, you just want to shoot with us, feel free to uh, chat it up. And, um, you know, it's, it's the reason why we joined AGS in the first place is, you know, education is a big part of what we do. And it's our goal to do all that we can to really help this industry and our friends out there, you know, to push this industry forward. So um, anyway, I know I've been talking for quite a bit now. Um, so with that said, uh, I think we can open up the floor to some questions. All right, thank you so much, Ross. Really enjoyed that and learned a lot from it that I'm definitely gonna take away for uh, my own business. So um, there is a question here, let's see. So Kendra is asking, as far as the online chats on the website, um, are there limited hours? Do you need to be available within seconds of someone wanting to chat? How would that work? So great question, uh, Kendra. A lot of the tools that are available out there, um, Client Book being one of them, Podium, um, there are a few other tools, even I think Facebook Messenger, Text Me Chat, all those options out there. Um, typically, when you're not there, there is a sort of leave a message option. So it just sends someone an email. And it's, it's tough to always be there, right? Always on. So what you don't want is to leave the chat unattended. If you do have it, you know, open. So if you do have your, your hours, make sure that someone is manning that. But a lot of times these tools will send it right to a text message. So if you have a staff member or several staff members manning this, and they're sitting there on their sales floor, or one person is in the back room or one, one person's on lunch, you know, they'll get a text so they could respond to the text from their phone. So it's not like they need to be like hovering on a computer 24 um, seven. But the worst thing you could do is have it on and then have it unattended. So make sure you, you coordinate between when you say like what your hours are through the chat administration settings or what have you. And then when you're not there, it says like, you know, leave us a message. We'll be happy to get back to you kind of thing. That way, no one ever gets that bad experience of like, hey, I sent you a message and you just blew it. I'm never shopping with you again. Right. So, you know, it could go bad if you had that. So thanks. Thanks for that question, Kendra. That makes complete sense. All right. And uh, Natalie is asking, our customer base is part of the older demographic. How should we start to make the changes to e-commerce um, with this customer base? That is a very good question. So um, what a lot of people like to do is sort of a mixed media marketing mix, right? So I know there's a lot of M's right there, but when, when you think about the perspective of, of that client, right, they react very well to phone calls, direct mail, letters, postcards, right? Uh, greeting cards, that kind of stuff. They react very well. Direct mail is not dead, okay? So traditional advertising, I know a lot of people have shifted their money to marketing, to digital marketing dollars. But what we try to do is, you think about a direct mail strategy. One of the best uh, direct mail strategies I've seen, like all out, you know, from start to finish, is what they call VDP, variable data printing. Um, there is a, actually, someone we're partnered with, I'm not trying to like, float a lot of other people's boats here as far as like, you know, promotion, promoting other companies, but this, the, the company is called Drive Retail. Um, they have a post part, postcard program. They are affiliated with the edge as well. So that, you know, you have, they have like no, no minimums. So you could send email, uh, direct mail pieces that have like uh, their names pr printed in diamonds or like their initials carved on a, on a tree, right. For the anniversary, it's really, really engaging and very, um, you know, provoking. So, 
those types of things. And in addition to that, when while you're at it with that variable data printing, what's good about that is the, print, the design itself is being printed. So you can have a special code that says something like, you know, visit our website.com slash something. And that something they're able to enter the code to get, let's say 10% off a piece of jewelry. Now, when they enter the code, what that does is if you don't, let's say there's someone who's 65 years old, you don't have their email address. All you have is their mailing address because they're super old school, right? This connects those two dots so that they get the physical postcard. They want the 10% off. So they go to the website slash deal or special, wherever you want to put them. You have this form and you enter the code and then they enter their email address. Now you can associate that account with that ID, right? With that code. So you, you've literally brought them from, you know, couch to, you know, to digital, right? You brought them from direct mail into the digital realm. So that's, that's one, at, one way to do it. Um, it's the age old question to, to get that demo, demographic engaged. Um, they're not on TikTok, right? <laughs> Clearly. Um, but the, the, the right answer is go to them and, and events are great. You know, anything old school, but like I said, be more human on your website and be more digital in your store. So when these people come in, you know, say, Hey, we do things differently. We take everyone's email address because we love to be able to hit you at any time with our specials and deals. I mean, you go into any store, they say that I don't fight it, especially if I like the brand. If I'm like a little sketched about the brand, I'm like, no, thanks. I'm not going to give you my email. And I probably shouldn't be shopping there anyway. But people are mo more so like likely to give you their information. So I hope that helps that little bit of information. There's a lot of answers to that question, but um, it is a very challenging thing to get that older demographic uh, into the e-commerce realm. Uh, Allison, I think you're still muted. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So next question from Courtney. Um, we are struggling with creating the perfect online order packaging. Do you have any companies that you know of um, that you do this really well and they could use this inspiration? Uh, very good question. Um, I will need to, I, I can check our uh, client base at Punchmark. We have a community group. We can even uh, actually use AGS as well and um, use the AGS Facebook group to ask. Um, I would leave that to the retailers. Um, packaging is a, is a very wide open thing that a lot of people it has so many facets to it, right? There's, you know, the cost clearly, because you can go really, really crazy with packaging. Um, but there's also like the ethically sourced aspect and like where the paper comes from, how many trees are you killing kind of things, whatever. So um, there's a lot of sort of uh, aspects to that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think I wouldn't, I don't have direct experience myself. Um, I know a few companies that have done some cool things with packaging, but, um, I don't want to favor any specific one, especially if some of our clients who are doing over a hundred thousand dollars in sales are like killing it with these few packaging companies. So I can, I'm happy to, to pull that out there. Um, and, um, you know, Courtney, if you want to, uh, shoot me an email. Um, you could send me an email to ross at punchmark.com. So I have your information. Um, I'm happy to send that information back to you, whatever I find from our, our group. And we can even ping like the AGS channel as well. Awesome. Okay. And then one more. So product descriptions need to be interesting. My employer is a vanilla kind of guy, which conflicts with the interesting. Do you have any thoughts on what to do when it conflicts with the branding? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, you know, neutral is better than, you know, too much. Right. So like this, like dazzle her with this special, like it becomes a little bit too much sometimes and, and over the top. Um, I agree that descriptions need to be interesting, but just think when you think about product descriptions and you think about anything on that product page, think Amazon. Right. Amazon overdoes it and you will be immediately overwhelmed. You go to any Amazon product product and scroll and scroll and scroll some more and then scroll some more. Right. So you'll see not only all the specifications of a product, there's there's really not much personality on it. in a lot of times. Right. The personality might be in like a video or something else. Or you might see some of the personality in the reviews, in the photos of how the product's used because of the massive amount of people on Amazon, you know, buying those types of products. Right. So 
Um, you're right that they do need to be interesting, but I think the interesting part doesn't necessarily need to show so much personality that it's overwhelming, right? Um, it just needs to be enough. I think the right word is verbose, right? It needs to be as, as verbose as possible to, to display as many parameters of the piece. Um, some people care about how much it weighs, what the texture is, how, you know, and, and a lot of times you just won't be able to scale that. But as much information as possible that you can put in, um, a lot of times one of our uh, best e-commerce clients out there takes a hybrid of things. They take, they start writing a gen generic description, then beneath that, they take a blurb about the brand, right? So, and then beneath that, they write something else even about like special, you know, returns and exchanges and, and like this whole huge block. Now, this whole huge block is a long thing to read, but at the same time, there's a lot of copy there. So if someone typed in any of those words, that's very SEO friendly. So in some cases, when it comes to the description and the product page, I know less is more in a lot of aspects, but more is more when it comes to descriptions. So um, it's it's tough to have that sort of display. But what I would do if, you know, for, you know, people who are vanilla and want to be very neutral um, I would just say stay as neutral as you can, but just try to talk about the utilitarian aspects of it. Talk about other aspects. You know, um, this would this would this piece would would match any woman's wardrobe or ensemble, et cetera. Um, great for an evening out with. I don't know. I mean, that might even be a little too playful and fun, but you're not getting too far into it. You could just say matching earrings available or, you know, just some of those additional things that that help out. So um, I hope that helps. Perfect for day to night wear or something like that. Right. And I think exactly. that putting more in the description um, specifically with online, it also just helps you gain that um, relationship and trust with the customer. Totally. Awesome. All right, well, if anyone has any more questions, uh, type them in the box. But at this point, I think that about wraps it up. Thank you very much, Ross, for uh, taking the time to speak with the community. And on behalf of the young title holders, thank you very, very much. And uh, we look forward to doing this again. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate everybody's time today. All right, bye.